first, live, local. This is Fox 12 Now. Hello everyone, this is Fox 12 Now. Just wanted to start off by showing that picture from Ski Bowl. You'll be seeing that a lot this week. You can see all of the snow coming down, the blizzard warning up there. Uh, that's a lot. That is a lot of snow that has happened since yesterday and it's gonna continue. So we've got some first alert weather news over at kptv.com. You can follow along with that. Uh, in the meantime though, this is Fox 12 Now. I'm Greg Nibbler. We live stream here every weekday starting at 1 p.m. Pacific. We're on our website, our apps, and of course on social media. So thanks for finding us wherever you are. And today we're talking about something that, well, we've been covering and everybody's been talking about here over the last several days and that is that Alaska flight that had the plug fall off it was found um, all the issues associated with that so I wanted to dig in a little bit deeper on this and just find out why that could happen how that could happen and really ultimately what this means going forward for those Boeing uh, Max 9 planes and so to do so we have an expert joining us right now uh, really appreciate him being here we have Chad Kendall associate professor of aviation aerospace science for MSU Denver um, I think I got that all right so uh, Chad thank you very much for for joining us and being a part of the show here appreciate it thank you for having me and, uh, you know, it's, it's this expertise is what we're li really looking for. So I think just the, the first question, I guess, just to start off is how could this happen? Sure. So the NTSB GO team just wrapped up their final on-site news conference last night, gave a lot of great information as to what happened. Uh, they're still going through the process on the why and the how. So here's what we know so far, that this was what's called a plug door. The MAX 9 can hold a capacity of 220 passengers. Alaska Airlines uses 179 passengers on their aircraft. So they don't need as many emergency exits on their airplane. They actually plug them. So if you were looking at the airplane from the outside, you would see a door. On the inside, you just see uh, the normal window and fuselage covering on top of that door. So. What we know now is that there was a mechanical failure of that door uh, and it came off of the airplane. Flight crew did a fantastic job responding to that incident and descending to a lower altitude, use of oxygen masks coming from the ceiling and then landing back at Portland. Yeah, it really was pretty amazing too that, that nobody was seriously injured in all of this. So that, that part is, is great. Um, but at the same time, the fact that this could happen and this follows up with a lot of issues that seem to be happening with these Boeing planes. Can you, um, I guess, to give us a little bit of back backstory on that, can you kind of maybe sum up some of these issues that Boeing has had with these MAX 9s? Well, pre-COVID, Boeing had some unfortunate accidents, uh, not in the United States, in MAX aircraft. Uh, those investigations uh, have been completed. This incident that occurred just a few days ago was not related to that. Uh, so, of course, Boeing and the FAA and the NTSB are, are taking a hard look at um, manufacturing process, suppliers, uh, to determine the why and the how uh, uh, that this event occurred. And so that's gonna take a little bit of time. The GO team just wrapped up. They're gonna go back to Washington, D.C. Their experts gonna look at the door. Very thankful that they found the door uh, on the ground, that it did not uh, pose any um, issues to people on the ground, but very thankful they found the door and they're gonna take a look at that and uh, finish up their investigation to determine how this happened. And some of the other issues now that have come to light since they've been inspecting these planes are loose bolts, from what I understand, some other concerns that have come up with other parts of this plane. And so I guess how concerning is that they are, that they are finding more issues with these particular planes? So as the NTSB said last night, they were aware of what United has found on some of their doors. All of the other aircraft are going through uh, inspection that the FAA had issued an emergency airworthiness directive uh, requiring these aircraft to be inspected before return to service. Uh, the NTSB inspected the other door on the other side of this particular aircraft and found no issue. And so because the NTSB is aware of what United has found, that's just part of the data. That's just part of this process of putting the puzzle together uh, to ensure that they look at everything to see what needs to happen next. So when you talk about that, just to, to explain that process, when you say they're looking at everything, so is this, they have the planes there on the ground, is the FAA there, is Boeing there, is Alaska there, who all is involved with inspecting the planes? Every stakeholder is there. Uh, Alaska did a phenomenal job in proactive uh, safety evaluation. 
It's really where safety starts is as a proactive process. And there were some, uh, some warnings that had ha happened earlier in this airplane uh, that was not associated with the incident, the NTSB uh, related to that last night. But Alaska was proactive in saying that they were not going to use this for overwater flights. It was going to be used for short distance flights. Uh, and the continuation of aviation safety as a proactive process, Alaska decided to ground these airplanes uh, in order to see what the FAA was going to do as far as inspection on the airplanes. The FAA proactive early on and uh, telling other air carriers, specifically United, uh, to inspect these particular type of airplanes. Alaska and United are the only air carriers that uh, service these airplanes and their fleet. And so there's been a proactive process and now there's an investigation. And so the NTSB, the FAA, Boeing, their suppliers, Alaska Airlines are part of this process to put all of the pieces together to determine the how and why. Um, quick, quick side question too, just about what you mentioned there with the warning lights. So that was not associated with this particular issue that happened on this Alaska flight. But um, one question that I know a lot of people have is with those warning lights, they decided to fly the plane just over land instead of over the open ocean. What's the reasoning behind that decision? That was a great response by Alaska Airlines. That's not a requirement by the FAA to do that. It was just Alaska Airlines saying that we've noticed some previous maintenance reports in this particular aircraft. And so before this airplane goes into a higher maintenance level of inspection at the airline, that we're just going to allow this airplane to fly shorter distances. And so it's a, it's a safety aspect uh, being proactive and making a decision uh, that has good outcomes. And flying it over land is a better option than, than flying it over the open ocean? So Alaska has the availability to use these airplanes on long haul flights over the water. Uh, it's called ETOPS in the airline world, extended twin engine operations. Uh, and so you don't have as many points to divert to if you were to have a mechanical issue uh, or any other safety related issue that, re that it causes you to need to divert. This case being over the land, uh, there are many more options to divert if you need to. That makes that makes sense. Okay, thank you for for explaining that too. Um, okay, so looking at it though, the the issues that are happening and obviously this in, investigation, the inspections are ongoing right now. What does this mean going forward though, as far as the safety of these particular planes and their availability to be used for flights? As the NTSB is conducting their investigation and going through the process of looking at all the parts that are at play here. Uh, and even in the past and in, in past investigations, if the NTSB needs to issue an emergency order to look at a, a fleet wide issue of aircraft, then they will do so. You see the European agency going through and following suit with what the FAA had said to inspect these particular aircraft. Uh, and so the NTSB, if they need to, they'll issue a emergency order for a fleet-wide inspection. Right now, they have not. They're going to conclude their investigation, and then they're going to provide their causal factors for this accident. And then through the FAA to the airlines who operate these aircraft, they'll provide further information as far as inspections or mechanics that needs to occur in the airplane. And how long do these investigations typically go? if there's an answer to that. So you saw how fast the GO team worked. I mean, they had a lot of investigators there on different aspects related to the mechanical operations, to the human factors operation, to, to the airline itself. Uh, it will take a little bit more time because they've got to take that door to Washington. They've got to use their equipment there to uh, look at this closer. Uh, so it, it will take some time, upwards of a year or more potentially, but as I said earlier, if they find something in the, in the time that they're looking at this door that, that needs to be addressed, that they're going to tell the airlines what to do. So is it, there's the potential then that these particular planes could be out of service for up to a year? That will be left up to the NTSB and their investigative findings. Okay, the, but the, the potential the, the there, report, they just... The, the report is going to take a while to, to get the final report from the NTSB during the, in, the investigation of this report, before we even get to the final report, 
the NTSB may, may tell airlines what to do. It may not be until the report is finalized where the NTSB uh, then shows their findings and tells the airlines and the manufacturers what they need to do. Is uh, an, an investigation, I guess, like this, is this fairly unprecedented when it comes to the airline industry or has something like this happened before? There have been other depressurization events that have, have occurred in aviation history. The last one in the United States was 2018. Uh, it was not related to this door in, issue. Um, flight attendants, cabin crew members, flight crew members are trained for these types of incidents initially and uh, recurring. Uh, and so uh, it, it has, uh, it, it is unprecedented in a sense of the uh, size of the hole that uh, is on the side of the fuselage. Um, we haven't seen that since the 70s, but um, the, the response by the aviation community uh, as far as active safety evaluation and then uh, being able to tell airlines what to do for inspections uh, has been phenomenal. Do you think going forward, and this is maybe just a, a personal opinion, but uh, do you think that people should feel comfortable returning to flights as normal? I believe so. And as I said, safety is an active process. And now we're going through an investigation process. We see the FAA telling airlines that operate these airplanes what inspections that they need to do and then return the aircraft to service. So those inspections are occurring. I don't feel any need for alarm. I feel like these airplanes are built safely. We'll wait for the NTSB to conclude their investigation, to report their findings on why and how this occurred, and then what needs to be uh, happening as far as further maintenance inspections moving forward. Um, do you think there's anything else that people should know about or, or just be aware of when it comes to this? I mean, it's a, it's a great time as a reminder for passengers to listen to the safety briefing from the cabin crew members at the beginning of flight. 2024 has already started with a couple of uh, significant airline events. And so spend some time listening to the cabin crew members giving that safety briefing, looking at where your emergency exits are, knowing how to use the oxygen mask. Because if an event like this occurs, you'll have an understanding of what you need to do in order to keep yourself safe. Not that this is likely to happen again, but I do prefer the window seat and I will never unbuckle my seatbelt ever again after seeing this. So uh, this is, uh, I think we're, it's just very fortunate nobody was hurt in this, but uh, this has been great information. And uh, I really appreciate you joining us to talk about this and go through the actual specifics of what's happening, because I think that can be confusing. It does sound like there's so many, so many different entities and people involved in the inspection and in what's going on to make sure that these are safe. So. This is, uh, this is good information to find out, and I appreciate you being here today with us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks a lot, Chad. Uh, anything else that you want to share, too, just uh, since you're on here, uh, about uh, what you do? Or, or is there anything for the university at all? I'm an associate professor in the Aviation and Aerospace Science Program at MSU Denver. I'm a former airline pilot. I teach classes related to aviation safety and the training of pilots uh, reacting, the, reacting professionally and safely to these types of events. Fantastic. Thank you very much for being here with us. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So that was some, some really great information, just finding out more about that flight. Obviously, we've, we've all been following along with. So follow the safety briefings when you get those in the beginning on your flight. That is something I will do much more. I'll, I'll pay much more attention to that from now on. Uh, all right. Thank you for joining us. This is Fox 12 Now. Again, we live stream here every weekday starting at 1. If this is your first time, thanks for being here. We have lots of episodes and segments for you to check out, both on our, our YouTube channel, on our Facebook page, and of course on our apps and on the website under the Fox 12 Now tab. We have more coming up at 12.30, or excuse me, 1.30, 1.30 p.m. So just in a, about 15 minutes or so, uh, we're going to be talking to a representative from Old Town in downtown Portland and the chair of the commission down there who is running for Multnomah County. And she's got some ideas about how businesses can uh, interact with the city, with the county, how some problems should be solved down there. And so she's going to be sharing her viewpoints on that coming up at 1.30. If you have questions or comments, you can drop those in on the social media channels. You're going to see this one end on Facebook and YouTube. We'll be back at 1.30 on there. I will continue on, on the apps and the website, though, with more content that you can only get over there. So it's a good time to download the Fox 12 Oregon app. But that's it for right now. I'm Greg Nibbler. This is